Hi, hi everyone. Oh, wait, Does, do you hear me well? It's good, right? All right, it's the first time in such a big, funny gym place. Nice to meet you all. And um, let me know if I lost the microphone or something, you know, um, I might get too excited and just, um, all right, let's start. So I'm going to talk about transformers and Francesco, as he nicely introduced, uh, I'll just test this, yeah. So I'll start with an introduction. And um, yeah, oh, the, yeah, a little bit of a text is on the left there. The ratio has changed apparently, but if it was unreadable, let me know. Oh, that one is good. Read from that one. So that's good. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, when I wanted to design a lecture for transformers, um, I, I I thought of a word in in Persian literature. There's a word called sahle montanen. It's actually originated from Arabic language. Um, in culture and literature, when you create something that people look at and they're like, wow, this looks so simple, but in, in fact, this is quite difficult. It's called a Sahle Montana concept. And electron transformers, I thought is a bit Sahle Montana. The reason is because many of you are probably already familiar with transformers. So you kind of know what transformers are. Some of you, some of you not, maybe. They, I, I didn't design the lecture for, you know, assuming you do, just saying. <laughs> And um, and there are thousands of tutorials out there. If you go, there's, I don't know, Ander Karpati talking about transformers, and there's many big names in the field talking about transformers, and they have really great lectures. So what I tried to do was actually I tried to complement their lectures. Often these lectures uh, take a top-down approach. So they take the transformer paper, they take the architecture, and they tell you, you know, this is the part, this is what it's doing, this is what the other part is doing, and so on and so forth. I decided to start from a problem, like, if you have a problem, how do we solve it? And then build up from there to, to reach the final transformer lecture, just to give a different perspective and complement those lectures out there. So the previous lecture was with Jimmy in computer vision. I heard it was great. I'm sure it was great. And Wednesday, you're going to have a lecture on large language models uh, by Nora. And um, I'm going to be in between. So I'm going to start actually connecting these two together. So kind of prepare also the stage for Nora to come and talk about large language models in and the problems of scale and so forth there. Let's talk about inductive biases. So you are all familiar with artificial neural networks, I assume. And uh, there's the universal approximation theorem, which uh, tells you that you can basically approximate any function given enough data with a deep enough or, or large enough uh, artificial neural networks. But in practice, that's not possible. It's because the search space is huge. The, you cannot easily find a solution to that. And as you probably heard in the computer vision lecture about the convolutional neural networks, one of the features that convolutional neural networks have is that they go look at the problem and they realize that, you know, in the image domain, if there is something happening in the corner or corner of an image, we apply the same function as if it's happening in another corner of the image. So we don't need to connect every input um, data of the image, every pixel to neurons and have a fully connected layer that takes a full image as input. Instead, we just share it and we have this you know, sliding window going up and down there. When it comes to transformers, we start noticing something else. We start noticing that there are often entities, there are often individual objects, or well, I, I just call them entities because it's a very generic term, but depending on the field, you can call them different things, that they can actually share a function. And when we share that function, actually, we have to combine them at some point in the end. So transformers come up with this sharing function and the effective way of combining them, which is the attention. And this introduces an inductive bias that has shown to be quite effective in many domains, including language models that you probably already know. About. I added something. I think the slides will hopefully be shared with you later. I added some reading here. Like if you want to know a little bit more about the, the idea of inductive biases and why they're important in artificial neural networks, there's definitely this great paper that you have to have a look at. So I'm going to start with a set of vectors because like, you know, transformers work with sets of vectors and they're really good in that domain. As an example, I start from an, from an example of an image domain. So let's say you're given an image. This is like, a, I don't know if it's super clear, but you can see it's like an image of a very little, there's a bowl, like there's a metal bowl there. And then the oranges, there's strawberries, there's a banana there. You can feed it to an object detector. It extracts objects from the image. And then it gives you image-based object representations, which you can basically use to classify. 
typically you would classify them individually. You would say, you know, what's the first one? You apply link and classify on top, it says fruits. What's the second one? It's a bull. What's the third one? They're oranges. But actually, for example, especially in this, in this case where we have this bull, which is really not visible, it's very difficult for individual classifiers to get that part of the image and convert it into the label, well, there's a bull. In fact, if you know that there are fruits there, it's much easier to classify the bull or oranges even, or, and, and, and so on and so forth. So basically the context is important. The objects help classify each other. Okay, how do we contextualize? Like a simple summation wouldn't work. Like if you take just the, the first red vector, which is from the fruits and sum it up to the blue one, sum it up to the green one, it won't work because you can do the same for everyone and they would just be equal vector. This just would, would be one summed up vector. So it doesn't make sense actually to do that. What does make sense is to have like a weighted sum of different vectors. So maybe in the first one, you would say, I want to care more about the actual object. I would give it an example of 0 0.5 weight. In the second one, like I, for the bull, it's not visible. I don't want to, I don't want it to disturb my classification of the, the fruits maybe. So I give it a smaller weight and so on. So the question is, how do we calculate these weights? How do we calculate the weights to some different, the vectors of different entities from? And that's where self-attention plays the role. So each vector has a look at itself and at the other vectors and decides what is the weight it wants to choose to be summed up to itself. We call the first vector the query vector, so the source vector that's looking, and the target vector that it is looking at, the key vector. The weight that we come up with, that's the attention weight. And the function that compares the two of these vectors together is the attention function. This can be just an MLP. You can take the two vectors, you can concatenate them to each other, and then you can find out a single individual weight that tells you what is the weight of that vector. Typically, it's not uh, this fully connected la layer, but it's rather the dot product between the two vectors. So basically, we just take the source vector, the query vector, and dot product it to the key vector. In the end, the sum of these vectors, the sum of the weighted vectors, gives us what is called the attention output. Sometimes it's also called the attention value, but I put output because I don't want you to mix it up with the value that I'm going to talk about later. So um, when we want to do this, we don't take each vector and always use it as a query, as a key, as a value, but instead we actually give it different roles. We have linear transformation that takes each vector, converts it to a query, says, you know, this is your role as a query, this is your role as a key, and this is your role as a value. And we basically work with these because, you know, for example, let's say if you hadn't done that, in the previous one here, if we had the vector itself attending to itself, the weight would have been one, right? Like the vector attending to itself. We don't want that to happen. That's one of the reasons. Some math just because it can help. So what we have is basically the matrix of the queries and the keys. Um, there's the matrix multiplication. That's why it's super efficient to implement because you can do matmol if you know uh, if you do numpy or uh, or JAX, for example. And there's a softmax. So we use softmax because it's better for the normalization. We do need normalization. And, uh, and then we multiply it by the values. That gives us the attention value in the end, which was the sum I showed you before. This would be basically the full table. So we, we have, um, I think, the, sorry, that was my mistake. No, no, it's too far. Anyway, I don't show it. But um, on the left um, column, we have the queries and the keys, and then we can compare each of them together. It gives us some weights, they're normalized. Then we multiply them by the values and we sum them up and it gives us the final output. In the attention is all you need paper, if you have a look at the figures, this is represented by this figure. So there's the queries from bottom, keys, there are, there's the match move operation, there's the scale and masking that I don't talk about for, you know, just to keep it simple. And then there's the soft max. And then the value, there is the match move to it. Um, I don't mind to give a pause at this point and get like two minutes of questions if there is anything super unclear, and then I'm going to move on. All right. Oh, maybe I should ask the organizers. Maybe technically it's not easy to ask questions now. Is it? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Hi. Very quick one. Uh, thanks. So the keys and the uh, queries, they are same vectors, just give them different names so you can do that product. Uh, there is a linear transformation. So here, basically, 
each of these connections that I have is a linear transformation of the original vector that, that creates the, the query or the queue or the value. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure. Yes. Sorry. Uh, it is not clear, uh, very clear to me, why the hidden representation of the bananas, the apple, and the ball will be similar in order to gain big attention between them. And then the weighted average of the ball hidden representation of the attention to become more certain that it's a ball because it has seen a banana and an apple. Maybe confused a little bit, but... Um, I don't know if I understood your question, but if I understood, I, I will give an answer. Let me know if that answers it. So this is just, just intuitive there, right? Like, for example, it's possible for the network to realize that it's uncertain about some parts of something. And then it can decide for itself that it, how much it wants to take from the other entities in order to, to complement itself. Maybe sometimes it doesn't take much, but maybe sometimes it takes more. So it depends on the context. Does it answer your question? Yes, partially. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. You can ask me later also if you want. Okay, I continue if that's, there's another question there, yeah. One, two, okay. I'm new in transform to Transformers, so it might be slightly silly, but why can do you Can you be use... a bit louder, sorry? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm new in Transformers, so this might be slightly chill silly, but uh, why do we use value uh, matrices? Why can't we use the embedding itself? Is it just a dimensionality thing? That's a good question. Um, I think it's a technical thing. I, I don't think it, it's that important. Depends on the domain. Actually, in many of the, uh, I might be, I might be wrong, but this is my, uh, this is what I think. You know, when you listen to Andrew Ng's courses, sometimes he says it turns out that this works good best. <laughs> I agree with him. Most of the, some of the things that I talk about, it turns out that this works. That, that's what I think. There might be a reason that I can't think of now, or it's not off my mind for this specific uh, problem, but that's what comes up to my mind now. All right, I, I will continue. All right, the next concept is the multi-head attention. Um, so it's cool to be able to sum different vectors together, but why not increase the capacity? Why, maybe sometimes you want to have a high weight for yourself, but also at the same time, you want to have another weight for another vector. Um, with multi-head attention, which was actually introduced in, in the attention is all you need, um, we do this attention process several times. So we have several queries, several keys, and several values, and we do it, for example, k times. And then it helps us to actually work better in the end. This is shown like that in the paper. So basically, if you look here, there's this, these linear layers, you know, they have they made this opacity low, like there are several ones, and then there's scale dot product is several, and, and so forth. And then they concatenate the output in the end. So which this becomes like a big, Big layer. For example, if the if the query vector, let's say it's the dimension is three, and then you have uh, I don't know uh, k times um, the multi heads, then you have three k as the output, and you concatenate this three k together. You fit it to a linear layer to bring it back to the original dimension later, which is three. So then there is this linear layer at the end. So in summary, transformers are actually just a fancy weighted sum of vectors. It's and not a big deal. It's just you know it's just summing just weighted sum. And then the question is, how do we extract the weights? There's dot product. It's nothing so difficult. So <laughs> I guess that's it. <laughs> um, there are a few details which play some important roles depending on the paper and depending on the application. For example, I didn't talk about the add and norm. It's just the residual connection that you have in computer vision. You basically, um, when you transform the vector, you sum it up to the original vector again. It also helps computationally and helps the gradients flow better. And in general, they have also shown to be an effective approach. And you also have a feed-forward connection to apply on top of the final X output that you got from that linear layer that I just talked about, which also helps with the capacity of the network and also because you need some non-linearities there. You can't just go linear. So far, everything I talked about, except for the softmaxes, which extract the weights, were just linear. And then there's the positional encoding, which um, makes more sense when I go into the natural language processing applications, which is now. So now I'm going to talk about transformers in NLP. This is what typically you hear about. Also here, I turned the head a little bit upside down. So transformers were originally proposing an encoder decoder architecture. I'm going to start with an encoder only architecture and then build a way up to there. So 
what I described so far was actually an encoder-only architecture. When it comes to natural language processing, an encoder-only architecture, for example, makes sense in a task like mask language modeling. In mask language modeling, you have as input a text like the movie and question mark great. Part of the text is, it's not just one part, it can be several parts of the text are masked and you want to predict um, what is the probability of different words that happen in different parts of this text. Um, usually you represent each word as a one hot vector. So if the word is movie and if your you know, full vocabulary size is 30,000, 30, uh, you have like a dictionary, right? Like you can say, the word that I have here, the movie is one and everybody else is just, just a simple one hot encoding. And what you want in the end is a probability vector over different words in your vocabulary size. For example, here, the movie is great, the movie was great, the movie had been great. I don't know, this, this, this depends. I just created up some, some, some values, 0 0.5 and 0 0.4, so they don't sum up to one. Hopefully there's something else there um, that adds up to this probability. And then you apply transformer on top. This is the same figure of the transformer I showed. So in order to solve this task, you just feed these tokens. It's a set of vectors. You can feed them to a transformer. They work best with it. And you, you, you aim to predict the, the word which was masked, which in this case is was. Everybody else doesn't matter. The loss, there's no loss there because you already know the words. And at, at inference time, you basically do the same. This is the architecture for a language model called BERT that you might have heard of. So one of the important things that BERT's, oh, I'm going to say that later. Let me tell, uh, explain the positional encoding. Positional encoding, that's important in BERT. So let's say you have a sentence that BERT followed the man. It's so far, the way we treat this, that will be equal to man followed the BERT because you know they're just vectors. As I said, there is uh, basically everybody is treated the same, but you want these two sentences to be embedded in different ways. As a result, in order to do that, you add some positional encoding to it, which depend on the position of that word on that specific location. So basically, this vector that I added there would be different if the man appeared at the first token in the sentence or if it appeared as the third token in that sentence. In the original paper, they used this sinusoidal function. So it was not learnable embeddings, but it was like a handcrafted function that, that added these representation. But now there's nobody uses that. So you just use the, this one. Or, or some other techniques that somebody found better technicalities. So yeah, so what, what I wanted to say before is that BERT was really cool because uh, when it came, it showed that it can be used for many natural language processing um, applications. Before BERT, in natural language processing domain, everybody was handcrafting a different model for a different task. If it was translation, it was a different model. If it was a sentence classification, for example, sentiment analysis, where you give an image, uh, give a sentence, and you want to analyze whether it's neutral, positive, negative, spam, whatever. Everybody use a different model, but when BERT came, it showed that when we learn these embeddings, we can basically use them and fine tune the model or, or train like a specific uh, layer on top for the downstream task at hand, and then it works best with the all. Decoder, <clears throat> decoder only transformers, unlike the encoder only transformers, try to always predict the next token. So it's not like every random word in the sentence is just dropped, but rather always the next token at training time. And at test time, it's like chat GPT. You give it something and it predicts the next token, next token, and so on. So if you're given man, you want to predict followed. If you're given followed, you want to predict the, of course, your predictions is a probability distribution. So it can, it can, it gives a probability dif distribution over different words. And that's why prompting is important in chat GPT, by the way, but I think Nora will talk about that. And you basically want to always predict the next token. Yeah, th this kind of approach is really good for generation because so far we didn't have generation. In the encoder only, you were given a sentence, you embedded it, and maybe you made a guess about the mask token, but, but in the decoder only, you can just generate. You can generate forever. And that gives you chat GPT. That gives you three shot learning. That gives you zero shot learning. That gives you all the fancy stuff that we have nowadays. Now we get to the original thing. So attention is all you need. Didn't talk with, uh, didn't work with any of these, but these came later. Attention is all you need proposed an encoder decoder transformer because the application was translation. So on one hand, your input was given. It was a source sentence. On the other hand, your output had to be generated. It was not given. It had to be generated token by token. So you could extract the sentence encoding by feeding it to an encoder only, or so basically an encoder. It gives you embeddings. 
And then you use a decoder only to do the next token prediction, which is why, by the way, I changed the order a little bit when I wanted to describe it. So yeah, you fit, fit the sentence to this figure, which I used before from the transformer as the encoder. And then you feed that to the decoder and token by token, you predict a translation. I hope my German translation was right. Mm -hmm. I studied in Germany, but still not, not so good in German. I'm okay. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> I have to talk about cross attention now because um, in this figure that I showed you before, which might have looked quite big, actually the left side and the right side are almost the same, except there's this connection between the right side and the left side. And that's a cross attention. So before I talked about soft attention, in soft attention, you assume that you have several sets of ve several vectors and they all belong to the same set. For example, your, your source language. In the cross attention, you assume you have two sets of vectors, two different, different sets of vectors, and one set is cross attending to the other set. It's just a terminology. At the end, it's the same. It's just you know to make it clear that you have two sets of vectors coming from different worlds and you want them to cross attend to each other rather than one set attending to itself. And that's basically that connection in the figure from attention is all you need. You're going to need it in Flamingo, by the way. We'll, we'll get there. So you're going to have the talk on Wednesday by Nora, and she's going to talk about all these fancy stuff, scaling up, RLHF, uh, which, which was actually quite important to, to get to where we are today with ChatGPT and the emergent properties of language models, few shot learning and context learning, how can you change? I was actually just telling uh, one of your colleagues here that uh, there's this paper by Mari Shanahan about role play. That's also interesting because he talks about how you can change um, your language model to role play for you. Like you can give it a different cat, um, um, character and it can act on that. It's just a paper, just a reference. Now I'm gonna to go to transformers in computer vision. I can give a break if you want. I mean, like a question break, not a break. <laughs> if anybody has a question, please. Break for me. Um. Yeah, so have encoders, Um. Is it possible for encoders to perform similar to decoders in generation tasks, given that in a way they sort of do the same kind of masking? Yeah, it's a good question. I was having a discussion with this with one of my close friends. We were fighting over it because um, it's terminologies at the end of the day. And nowadays, you know, you, when, you, when you talk to a community and you want to refer to something very specific, you use that term. But in an abstract world, it's actually not that different. So the difference of encoder only and decoder only is really just in the mask. One of them is random. One of them is, we call it a causal mask, where it's like a um, lower triangular um, matrix where there are ones and zeros all around. And um, I mean, the, the architecture is quite similar. It's just about how you mask it. What is important is which mask you use in training because decoder only is really turned out to be very good in training. So all the, I hope uh, I hope I'm right, but uh, I think all the features that an encoder only can do with mass language modeling, if you do it with next token prediction, you can reach them. So if you if you train with next token prediction, you're going to be just as capable as a nowadays with all the different hacks and tricks that you use. But yeah, context conceptually is the same kind of. Um, so, thank you for the presentation. Sure. Uh, I I was wondering if you could explain a bit more on the intuition of the origins of transformer. So, if I look at the encoder and I only look at okay, I only have one transformer, right? Like at the n is equal to one. Um, the intuition that a lot of people use in tutorials is, oh, this is a like words are now expressed as weighted average of the whole set of words. But then the moment the n is higher than one, that intuition is kind of lost. And I always the moment that what happens? That n, the amount of I don't know how to call it, encoder layers yeah, is yeah. higher than one, that is lost. It's, 
is it now just a non-linear function of the words or if it has one layer only one layer of if, you, if we only have one layer yeah we only do a so you know a, a self attention yeah it's you could think about the the output is a weighted average of the words yeah if we do more than one this is lost um so this intuition doesn't make any sense anymore if you do more than one layers, I mean, you do have the weighted average again. It's just that on top of the previous embedding. So your embeddings are now in a different space. So the first layer already hopefully transforms the input to a manifold where it has some meaning. So for example, you can apply like a TSNE or some sort of high dimension visualization. And you probably can visualize how the, the separation happens. For example, you might be able to see that in the first layer, I don't know, like um, there are noun verb separation. The second layer, there's some other meanings, clusters, you know, so different clusters I shaped are shaped depending on each layer and the manifold it transforms you to. Does that make sense? Maybe. Thank you, you can also much. talk to me later if you want. One in front, sorry. Hello, thanks. Sure. I'm used to fine tuning transformers, encoder models. And so when you fine tune a transformer, let's say uh, you are going to modify those embeddings at the end. But uh, before uh, uh, you pre train a model, are those embedding uh, random? Can you give an intuition about this point when you start? In the beginning, they're definitely random. Yeah, they're initialized super random. And then slowly in, at your pre-training, it, it gets shaped basically into different embeddings. Yes. And uh, actually, when you fine tune, depending on the scale of your fine tuning, how heavily you fine tune, you might lose what you pre-trained or you might keep it. That's why that's that's a trick itself. You probably are dealing with that. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. I can continue if there's no urgent questions. Okay. Uh, now I will talk about transformers in computer vision. I mean, I said it, I do this because of the previous lecture, but also I did computer vision. So that's why you see all these things around. Um, but of course, NLP is amazing and they're all connected at the end of the day. And so I am gonna, going to talk about multimodality also in, in the same section. Oh, actually, this is, this is one of my works. So um, this actually builds upon what I started with in um, in this paper in classification by attention, the idea is that you have an image, you extract objects, you contextualize the representations in the object by feeding it to a transformer. And then it gives us a new set of contextualized representations that hopefully has these features that I talked about, like that the bowl is aware of the fruits. So the embedding for the bowl, we haven't classified yet, is aware of the fruits and so on. And we can, we can help classify that further. Um, there you, you can actually come up with something. So the reason why I put this here is because I wanted to talk about supervision on the attention. So this is nothing that typically people talk about. But attention weights are, 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 are of course, like um, trained to, to, to happen at train time. Um, but you can learn them. You can push. You can say, I want you to have this specific weight. And um, this is not something that you would typically do, but it does bring some, some features. For example, in this work, um, the idea was that your classification is actually the weight of your attentions from cross attending a set of trainable parameters that belong to each class. For example, the class fruit, well, I, I don't know, apples, oranges, whatever. They each have representations of themselves and they can cross attend to the image and then they can decide basically what is the attention weight and that will be our classification weight. What does it help us with? What it helps us with is you can take the attention values, go back to the scene and combine them together and then classify again. Why? As humans, when it's actually what, what, what happens later in the multimodals. As humans, when we look at an image, we come up with representations, we decide what it is, but then we have also some sort of non-perceptual knowledge. For example, we, have, we might have read a book. We, we know that from the books that, I don't know, like the uh, Hindus uh, dress the cow. So if you, if you look at a cow, which is dressed, we can classify super easily if we use this some sort of prior knowledge, which is not visual, but rather textual. I'm just going to fly over this. This is, this is just to you know, give some perspective on what other possibilities out there, because that's the idea of research. You have to you know, look with an open mind. But um, yeah, that, that, that was just there. Um, the VITs are, are another very important work out there. An image is worth 16 by 16 words, which um, basically took the transformers 
And instead of having a classic, instead of having an object detector that first extracts objects from the image, they basically cut the image into patches. Which let's have all the patches in in a transformer, and then let's let let the transformer contextualize these patches before we can classify it. What is important in Vite uh, compared to what I'm going to talk about later is there's no language model here. This is just a transformer. It's similar to the language models, but this is just a transformer. Whereas in Flamingo and Frozen, which I'm going to talk about now, is actually a pre-trained language model. So that's the domain of multimodal models. In the multimodal models, such as in here, the idea is you want to feed an image to the model and come up with a caption, not just a class. You don't just want to say, you know, this is an orange, this is a whatever. You want to be able to generate, like here the example says, uh, a small red boat on the water. Uh, in Frozen, they showed that if we take a pre-trained language model and freeze it, just notice there are signs that says frozen versus there's another sign which doesn't say frozen. That's the red one. And you can just train a convolutional neural network to adapt to these frozen layers. What happens is you, you come up with a, with a vision model that can give you captions without having to have the classification and the linear kind of task that we had before. One feature that it comes up with is you can talk to the model. You can feed it like an image. You can ask a question. It can answer it. You can play with the with the world in between images and texts, basically. Flamingo, that is a little bit more famous than Frozen, actually did something similar. But they said, well, we can also pre-train the vision model with um, for example, well, in this case, a contrastive loss. You might be familiar with Clip. I think Jimmy, I saw in her slide, Jimmy talked about Clip. So the backbone here is trained in the Clip style. There are contrastive image and text losses. And the language model is trained uh, with next token prediction, decoder only. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, that's decoder. Chinchilla is decoder only. I think Chinchilla is decoder. Yeah. Um, oh, OK. And basically, there are some adapter layers in between that you train just to adapt what is coming out of the image with what goes into the language. This is actually kind of funny. I did some experiments. So, um, you know, you would imagine what goes into the language model is a set of vectors that says, I don't know, cat, ear, eyes, whatever. But that's actually not the case. What happens is, oh, I, I had to, I, I, actually, in this case, it happens a little bit because it's clip style. Sorry, I have to explain it. This is cool. So I go back and explain this because this is funny. This is about frozen. So what happens here is the model learns to kind of adversarially, I would, I would call it some sort of adversarially attack the language model. So it, it learns what to give to the language model to, to generate that caption. But if you actually try to look at the vectors themselves that come out of the, the vision model and try to classify them, or, or, or what I did was, you know, you would expect if you use the word embedding matrix, and if you try to inversely find which word they, they relate to the most, you can't do that. It doesn't have any meaning. That, that, that was kind of funny. But anyway, in Flamingo, it happens because we are using a, a, a clip-based encoder. So there's cross-attention layers in Flamingo, which is important because the self-attention is for the language model. So the language model decoder only, only uses self-attention layers, right? We basically have them all attending to each other. But what happens is we introduce cross-attention layers in between that connects the, the language, the decoder-only language, to the vision model. And they, they cross-attend to what's coming out of the image. And that's the only thing which is trained. So there are many little parameters trained in Flamingo, which is one of its great features. Another thing which makes Flamingo really great is the interleaf training, which I think was not there before uh, in another work. There, there, is, there is one work by Facebook, I think, which was kind of parallel. But uh, the point is that um, instead of giving it one image and one text and trying to train on that, you can give it a mixture of images and texts and ask the model to predict the next token always. And the next token here can be basically your text or it can be your image. Actually, in Flamingo, your image, you, you don't put a loss on top of that. But the idea is that you have a mixture of language and text tokens that go into the model. One of the cool things that Flamingo gives us is you can chat. You can give it an image and you can chat with it. You know, all the vision models we had so far, they just you just give it an image, it generates a caption or it generates classes. 
it doesn't chat with you. But when you have a language model in there incorporated that has its own self-attention, frozen layers that you can, you know, already chat with it. If you also connect it this way with the image, you can fit it the image and you can say, I don't know if you can actually see these because I cannot, but you can see like, this is a picture of two teddy bears on the moon. And that's, that's what the model tells you. And then you say, what are they doing? And it says, um, sorry, actually, sorry, I have it here. <laughs> They're having a conversation. What object are they using? It looks like a computer. Is it surprising? Yes, it's surprising. Why is it surprising to you? I think it's surprising because teddy bears are not usually found on the moon. So this is interesting because it's using the capabilities of the language models, some, somehow related to what I talked to you about before. Um, you're, you don't always see everything in your images, but you read about that. And you can use your language models to make a conversation and do some sort of reasoning on top of the images and talk to you about that. I'm going to stop here and ask for more questions. And here are the people that definitely help me a lot with different things different concepts, different figures, and uh, also my professor who helped me with how to teach. Thank you very much. <laughs>